Hi, Laura Pollock back again, and I'm very excited. I have a whole new lighting set up, and I'm finally going to do it in landscape mode. Today I'm going to show you why I like to paint on a very dark background so that you can see the difference between making a mark on a very light piece of paper versus a very dark or even black piece of paper. The drama is a huge difference. Here I am in my laundry room, and my husband and I are avid bicyclists. We use these types of lights to make sure that motorists see us. This demo is to show you what it looks like in a well-lit light room, almost like a red pastel on light paper. Now I'm going to shut off the light. It really has a great deal more drama and certainly would garner the attention of anyone passing by. Here I have a piece, a scrap actually, of some UART that I have already tinted black. And this is the beautiful UART the way it comes when it's shipped to you, sort of a cream color. What I wanted to do is show you the difference between making a mark on the beautiful cream color and then making a mark on the black. The drama here to me is amazing. I love it. And when you make expressive marks, they just pop off. If I could hold it steady. Then when you take a nice bright yellow, look at the difference that you get. It's a beautiful mark, but now look at it. Wow, that just pops. So that really is why I like the drama of a very dark piece of paper. I've had in my mind that I want to do something sort of opalescent, so we're gonna give it a try. What I do is I'll take a piece of pastel, and in this case, just so that you can see it on the camera, I'm gonna use a lighter gray. Normally, I would just use a piece of vine charcoal. And the first thing that I'll do is I'll mark it off into thirds, just to give me a few points as reference for measurement. These marks will become obliterated during the painting, and I'm not worried about it. I know also that I want to have my focal point right around this area. I joke with some friends, I heard a phrase, and I love it, and I keep telling students about this. This is where the party's at, right around here. So I'll actually make a little tiny light circle to keep reminding me that that's gonna be my focal point. When I make entry and exit points into a painting, and by that I mean marks that go off towards the edge, I will bear in mind that I don't want a mark right here going off, and the exact same place on the other side. So I will vary the distances between edges. You'll see me do that. It will make more sense in just a minute. What I'd like to do also is create a lot of drama. In order for that to happen, I believe that we have to have dynamic angles. So I'm gonna make a mark here very lightly. I might get rid of it. You can see how easily I can obliterate it that will point me to my focal point or my party. I don't want the exact same angle going straight down, so I'll shift it a little bit here and maybe make it come up here. This is just a little bit of a road map. This, none of this is gonna really stay to the very end, but it's helping me figure out some things. This will be one of my rock paintings, my geologic. So I'm looking at the distance between here and here, and I don't want my mark to come out here the same distance. So I might come a little further and then turn it back, and then come out there. That's a little bit better, but it's still a little bit similar. So I might just obliterate that and come further there. I'd also like to have a little bit of a surprise element. 
So I'm going to put something here. Scale is really important in a painting. If you have something that's dominant here, you don't want to have something yelling just as loud down here. So if I have, let's say, an opal shape right up here, I'm going to make sure that whatever's down here is very subservient to the dominance of this. I might bring in a few lines over here, again pointing to my focal point. I'm also going to take note that this is very similar. It's almost dividing it in thirds. I'll probably change that a little bit later on. And then maybe for rhythm I'll put something here. The color theme scheme that I'd like to have for this will be in the greens and blues. Something a little different for me. I usually do reds and blacks. So I'm going to give this one a try. What's really smart and nice about keeping paper towel in your hand is you can test a color perhaps against another. I'm going to start picking a palette of blues and see how I like them. Mostly these are blue earth, and I really like that color probably in the middle on its journey to the center here. So I'm going to make a mark with that, and it's just lovely on that dark. I'm going to put it back. I have blue earth set that I'm working with today, and they are organized in chroma and value. So I generally put my pastels back. Before I had this set, or when I'm not using blue earth, I will have a separate box that I will keep for just the colors that I'm using. This is almost the same value, but it's a little bit greener. And those two play very nicely together. So I'll be using that. And then I'm going to go into some more of the more aquas. Now this is a very dark one, so this will start to go towards the edge. As I get closer to my focal point, I'm going to be going lighter here, and I'm going to get a little bit warmer. I'm going to assume in this painting, as I do in many of my other paintings, that whatever I put here is emanating its own light. That's how I like to get the glow. It has its own light source, not from outside the painting coming onto it or in it, but from inside the painting coming to the elements in the painting. Let's see how this one works. Very nice. Coming closer to the focal point. I'll go a little bit lighter and see how that works. Again, it's nice to wipe it off. You get to test it on white next to another color and see Oh, that's it's really a nice transition going that way. Now I'm going to go to a slightly yellower green and see how that works. So the transition is working beautifully. And then eventually I'll end up going into a more lime green. You can see here. It's actually in the yellow family, but it has a lot of blue in it. And the way I know that is because if I hold up a true yellow, you can see the difference right there. Let's see how this one looks close up. Okay, that'll work as my light, some of my lightest lights. What I'm going to do now is take one of those Terry Ludwig eggplants and see just how dark that is. That happens to be the darkest of the darks. This one I have been using a lot and you can see just how dark it is even on a simple paper towel. Now you're going to see how dark it is on a tinted UART piece here. It is so black. Let's put a bigger mark so you can see that. It is just lovely. So this I'll be using to carve back and forth. The next step will be to just do some very big swipe block-ins. 
Here I have some very new blue earths that I've had to replenish. So I'm going to do some very big swipes. It's going to be dark mostly around the outer edges. Again, because my light source is here, and this whole area will probably reduce down to about this. Here's an interesting tidbit. When you start painting, listen to the marks that you're making, the scratching on the board. When I first started taking workshops, I was doing this, and I still do it and I have to catch myself. Listen carefully. They all sound the same. What's fascinating is you know that you're getting some interest in your marks when it almost sounds like Morse code. So that's a telltale sign. That'll help you quite a bit with your mark making. I'm going to continue making these marks all the way around. Another thing about mark making that I truly enjoy, I'm going to wipe this off a little bit, is watch a concert pianist who bangs on the piano but then lifts up slowly. If you do the same thing with a pastel and you get a nice edge and you put it down, push forward a hair and then flourish, you get an amazing gradation that is giving a lot of depth to a mark. And not everything has to be covered on a painting. You can leave a vignette around the edges. You can have areas where the paper itself shows through. Now I'm going to start to go over some of these little marks, but I'm going to lighten my touch. How fun is that? Just that blue. I'm hoping you can see that. The next color, again, is a replenished blue earth, but it has a little bit more yellow in it. Just a touch. You're going to see the difference here. I don't know if you can see that difference. Again, I'm trying to remember to listen for my mark making and vary it. Dot, dash, angle. Another thing that's really important is to move your arm and your wrist. Get as much variation. You are trying to entertain your observer, your viewer, not during the painting process necessarily, but in the end process. We can't entertain if everything's all the same, like marching soldiers. We get boring. If we do this, 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 it becomes a little bit boring. So let's vary it. And you can hear the flourish, the dots, the dashes, and I'm going to fill in some of these areas, but note that I'm going to move my arm in all different ways. That helps create different dynamic angles. It helps create interest. And I'm doing that thing where I put it down and swipe up. You get very interesting marks that way. At the very end of the painting is where they say the calligraphy comes. I agree with that. However, I will still try to make the marks, even at this level, interesting. I'm going to switch colors now. Too much of a good thing, and it gets a little boring. Let's see what we can go to a lighter value now. This is a well-loved blue earth. Another tidbit that I encourage you is when you're ready to change colors, test it. Don't make big marks and go, oh my God, what have I done? Just give it a little test. Yes, that works. Again, I don't know if you can see that very well, but I've gone a value lighter as I get closer to my focal point. Focal point right now is just a big blob of black, so that doesn't say too much, but it will start to get some sheen to it. As you see, I'm trying consciously now to make some different marks. 
different angles. I'm going to try also to make everything point to that, but more subtly, not big arrows. This will be toned down quite a bit as I get to the final. I love putting it down, pushing forward just a hair, and then pulling away. Especially if you need to get a straight line, for instance, if you put it down, find a nice edge to it, put it down, push forward, and then pull, it's a whole lot nicer than just doing this. That doesn't have quite as much character as, let's say, this. Put it down, push forward, pull. It gives quite a bit of character and depth, just in a single line. Another thing is to make some surprises in a painting. Things that might be unexpected. Once again, I'm going to put it down, push forward, pull back. So it's getting lighter and lighter. I'll do a few more marks right here. I'm going to start to break that circle. I don't really want it to be a circle in the end. Now I'm searching for my next color. Almost the same value perhaps, but let's go into the greeners. This is this might be too dark. So again, make your test mark before you commit. Ah, that's good. Has a little bit of a glow to it. Another thing is not to forget your grays. Grays are what make the really bright colors pop. I can't emphasize that enough. I'm going to pull a less vibrant color of this out and see what happens with that. So this is the same value in the box of Blue Earth. Let's do a little test mark. Yes. So this painting needs these types of sort of blah colors that you go, oh, I don't like that. But if you ever look at John Singer Sargent, at the luminous peach cheeks of little girls or the luscious lips, the way he has been achieving that is by putting very dull, almost gray colors next to it. Also notice that I like to work all around a painting. Bring it up all at once. See if you can have a color harmony and unity that takes place. Putting this gray back, going to a slightly grayer green. This is a very dark one. I want to put a little bit of this more on the outside to make those blues that are very luminous pop. Give it a little bit of depth. Again, working all around the painting. I'm listening for my marks. In one of my demos, I mentioned that try not to get the alcohol as you're tinting this paper to go under the paper. Well, that's what's happened here. And if you can see, I have a ripple. It's not hitting there. So I'll have to work with this paper and understand where it's going. You can squeegee it back down, which is wonderful, but I'm in the middle of a painting, so I don't really want to do that. So that makes some of those beautiful blues pop a little bit more, and I'll even leave some of the black of the paper showing. Might be time for me to try to figure out what's going to go on here. I'm going to go back to my Terry Ludwig, again wipe it off, and start to define some of the shapes. Again, it's not going to be a circle, it's going to be sort of organic. And I'm going to have lines that are going to lead out, but as they lead towards the edge, I'm going to make sure that those edges are a lot softer. I don't want my viewer to leave. If I put, for instance, I'm going to get rid of this afterwards, but if I put a big dark line right there, you're going to be inclined to go out there because there's going to be a lot of contrast. Right now I'm just going to tamp it down and soften it. And I'm going to open this up. Oh, I hate when that happens. 
favorite Terry Ludwigs. And in here, I'm going to try to put almost like an opal cabochon. We'll see if I can make this work. By the way, it is really important for you to know, I have stacks and stacks of unfinished paintings that just didn't make the grade. So never feel bad if you go, oh my gosh, another failed painting. Just remember there are no failures, just more information. One of my favorite sayings of all times. So I'm pushing, I'm pulling, I'm varying my pressure, I'm varying my angle as I go on this. This is very strong here at the edge. I will soften that. I don't wanna take you out of this painting, I wanna bring you in. And I would like to have almost something to seat and anchor you here at the focal point. So I'm gonna make that bigger. And another thing that I'm gonna do is, this will have a tendency to fall off. So I'm gonna actually rub it in so it stays there. Normally I don't use my fingers, but in this, I don't want it to sit on top and then fall off. So I'm really rubbing it in. The only way you can do that without losing your whole fingertip is with these gloves. When I put a mark on the paper, this is like learning how to drive a car. There are so many things to remember. Check your rear view mirror, where's the gas, where's the brake. What I'm trying to tell you is that you have to remember here to vary the pressure. Press hard, lighten. Squiggle, press hard, lighten, push, get a little bit of a different character for that line. I love to talk about the character of a line. So if I just do this, plain straight line, that has absolutely no character. But if I widen it and I lighten it and I get a very hairline mark on it, like there, it really gives a lot of character. Again, I'm looking now at my exit point here to see how does it relate to here. Oh, that is almost the same. It's a little bit more here. I'm okay with that one. How is it there? It's bigger than that one. For instance, I wouldn't want to have a line that goes at the same angle straight out. That would be sort of boring. So I'm gonna do this and bring this up here again lighter harder very tiny then push harder lighter harder okay and then then here i'm gonna lock it in and soften it i don't want your eye to go there i've got to make some decisions as to what i'm going to be doing here how big it's going to be is it going to be one beautiful rock? Is it going to be polished? So I'm going to tiptoe into it a little bit and go with some grayed down blue greens just to start. And I'm going to pull against the darks. So I find an edge, I put it down and I pull. I'm thinking that a stone is going to be right around in here and that this layer is going to come up over it. I don't know, I've been observing opals. I'm just fascinated with the, the color that's in them. And what I've found is, again, it's the grays that allow the beautiful color to show through. So we'll have this be a sort of rounded edge all right, so I start with a mid value. It's almost a dark value. And then I'm gonna work up lighter. In pastels, it is always easier to work light over dark or starting from dark to light than vice versa. So always work from dark to light, except for your last little tidbits of highlights. 
What I've been observing about opals is they have almost a full spectrum of color. I'm going to try this magenta pink and see if I can just put a touch of it on there and see what happens. That might work in the end. Um, I'm going to take almost the same value but in a grayed down version. Yeah, almost as if it's a color beneath the surface. Then I'm going to go into a grayed orange. I have to clean it off to see what the color really is. Let's see if this is going to be any good. Yep, it has a little bit of a glow to it. Now I'm going to go to a lime, lemony lime green here. Got to clean that off. Ooh, yeah. And I'm going to go back into the blues, but in a more blue-gray. Lost and found edges are a whole art in and of themselves. That will be another lesson. So I'm just, notice I'm twisting my, my elbow, my shoulder, my wrist to get different marks pushing. That's another thing too. Not only do you pull, but you push. You get a whole different set of marks when you do that. So I'm going to try to make a very hard edge. So look what happened. I really don't like this. It's one bump, two bumps. Again, I don't want uniformity. So I'm going to carve into it and that works a little bit better. I'm going to go to a lighter color. I'm going to test this aqua and see how it looks on here. Just a little mark. It's okay. It works in there. Note, turning the angle, making marks. As I get closer to my focal point, I want my light to emanate from it and highlight it. It's getting there. So I, the image that I'm hoping for is that these outer layers are also opal, but they're really looking to this lighter opal, which I will get lighter and lighter for its uh, luminescence, opalescence, shall we say. Here's another trick that I love. You can mark a pastel like that and then get these parallel marks on it. Just lovely. So you notice I'm working all around, almost in a circle, turning my elbow, turning my wrist. Some of these are weirdly uncomfortable, but you get some very nice variation. Am I getting the glow yet? Let's see. And what I call is the leading edge. The edges that are closest to my focal point. I'm going to put this back, try a different color. Same value, but greener. Let's see if it works. Yes, it works. I didn't want too big of a jump yet. So listen to the strokes and the mark making. When you're painting, you want to have a variation. So a little push, a little pull. And then grade eight and take some of this outward. A few surprises farther out. And remember that you can very subtly point your viewer to your focal point. Remember to use the edges of your pastel, those corners. They are so fun just to do these subtle little marks like that. You have to remember to use every part of it. I paint like in a funnel, 
I start out and I pour everything down into the focal point area, loose and then tighter. Squinting, of course, you've heard is so important. It helps you see the values that you're working for. I'm going lighter yet again in the greens. I think it's starting to work. I'll have to stand back. I'm painting sort of sideways so that you can see. Now my marks are getting a little bit smaller. They're too uniform for my taste. I'm going to start to change it up a hair. Again, push, pull, dot, line. Starting, starting, it's coming along. So any edge that's facing this is going to be lighter than away from it as if this was a light bulb. I'm gonna work on that since it doesn't look like much of a light bulb right now. I'm gonna to try to make it lighter. A lot of times you see opals that are almost milky in color. That's sort of... I've stood back from the painting for a bit. I've even pulled up some of my references for opals to see what I'm missing. Right now, it just looks like a muddy gray blob. I'd like to show you something that's a little trick where you just take a nylon cheap paintbrush, and if there's an area you don't like, don't swipe it off totally. You can just tap at it and note how it will just fall off very nicely, straight down. So if there's an area that you don't think is working, then just touch it and it'll come straight off. Very simple. This is an, a pretty nice chisel edge, flat brush. Every painting, in my opinion, goes through the awkward stages, much like a teenager does. And I think that's where I'm at. It's pretty darn ugly right now. I love the saying I heard someone say, begin like a brick mason, end like a jeweler, where you get more precise as you get closer. Lovely saying. I wish I could remember all the different slogans and thoughts that people have said and who to attribute them to. In the meantime, while I took my little break, I pulled out another Terry Ludwig eggplant, so I have a big fresh stick to work with. One thing I also found is that when my fingers are down like this, I'll end up rubbing a delicate part of the painting, so I have to hold the pastel almost like I'm drinking an English tea. Get those other fingers out of the way. I also want to show you how to do a three-fingered hold. I have to pull my gloves back so that they're not baggy at the top. For anyone who ever has airbrushed, it, there's a lever on an airbrush that helps uh, direct the nozzle and the strength of that nozzle. So you hold it with thumb, third finger, and you use the index finger as a lever to give pressure. Push, pull, dot. Look at the, just the character of that little mark. Sometimes you get some wonderful surprises. The big thing to learn is when to leave them alone. I made a mistake on one of the paintings that I had shown the other day when I was in the washdown stages of it and I was panicked. I thought, oh my gosh, my underpainting has dripped. I'm, I've ruined it. And I stood back and I thought, well, wait a minute. Maybe that will actually enhance it. Again, knowing when to leave something alone, that's a big trick, not easily done. Here I have one of those three humps. I'm gonna try to change that 
and create more of an angle without disturbing what I really liked there before. But we can't get too precious. If something doesn't work, we still have to change it. I'm going to start with a slightly purpley back into my opal here. And do a few marks. Again, see how I'm pulling my fingers away so that I don't pick up anything over there. And since I want this edge to seem that it's closer than the stone, I'm going to create a shadow right here. Let's see if I can pull that off. And then I'll have to put a little bit of a highlight to show its roundedness on it. I'm going to use a little bit of it on this side. Now I need to bring up the edge here all the way around. So let's go to some of the lighter blues and greens. This is very bright now. I'm giving a little bit more of a press. Much of this has been, if you had to decide on a scale of one to 10, how much pressure am I really putting down on it? Most of those were like on the outer ones, a two or a three. These are getting to be a seven or an eight. Uh, when I really finish off the painting and it's almost impasto, where I'm leaving a lot of pigment on there, it'll be a 10. So let's assume the light's coming from here. And I just love trying to get the glow. I'm gonna step back, which is really critical to do often. Somehow, when we're sitting close up to a painting, it's really hard to get a feel for what it's looking like. We get involved in it, we see what we want to see. Here's a darker blue. I need to put a few more marks here. I'm going to change the angle of that and do that. Broader marks on the farther edges of it, and some wispier marks, a little lighter. Again, I need to get into the closer value parts here. I think this is still going to be too dark now. I'm getting to the lightest parts. This is just a hair lighter, but may not be enough. Yeah, I want it to go a little bit lighter than that. Let's see what I can pull off. This is the next one in that value scale. Give it a test. Yeah, that's pretty good. It does seem to be losing chroma. It almost looks like it's a white. So I'm going to go over to a different color. Here we go back to that. And since this is close and this is emanating light, I'm going to put find an edge, clean it off, find an edge, put it down, I'm going to rock for it, push a little forward to create a strong edge and pull away. Now I'm trying to get that glow. Here, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to find an edge, rock for it a little bit. Okay, I found it. Push a little forward and pull. Notice the marks are getting smaller near the focal point. A little more excitement and movement. The shape of it is turning into a baked potato, so I've got to change that a little bit. And I'll start carving in. I'm going to take my old Terry Ludwig, the one that you saw me break, and start to carve a little bit into the shape of it. Let's get something a little more interesting. Push down here. I'd like to address this issue right here. This is the subservient piece to this. And I keep the values very dark towards the outer edges because I want to draw you in. I want to funnel you in to where the lightest light and the darkest dark 
bar and that should be right there. 